Hi everyone, welcome to CCI's webinar on CNOR certification. It's five o'clock here in beautiful downtown Wheat Ridge, just outside of Denver, Colorado, and I am happy to be able to share some information with you about what is probably one of your professional dreams to become certified as a perioperative nurse. A couple of housekeeping things before we get started. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please go ahead and type them into the chat window, which is in the lower right-hand corner of your computer screen. And I'll be pausing periodically to answer questions and certainly again at the end. This is not your only chance to be able to talk with CCI. If you've got questions after we finish tonight, please don't hesitate to email our amazing credentialing specialist at info at cc institute I'm required to provide this disclaimer before any of our presentations. CCI provides a variety of resources to assist in preparing for the exam. I will be talking about them briefly, but my mission tonight is not to sell you things, it's to provide you information and resources that you will then decide what is most useful for you. Any of our products online practice exams, prep for cert classes, study guides are not a requirement in order to be successful on the exam. And the more things you purchase, either from us or anyone else, does not uh, increase your chances for success. My name is Julie Maurer, and I'm the Nurse Manager for Education Development here at CCI, and I'll be your tour guide for tonight's presentation. Here are our objectives. We're going to look at eligibility requirements for CNOR certification. We're going to look at what's on the exam. And I'm not giving you any hidden secrets. Um, everything that I talk about tonight is on our website. So if you haven't been to our website, that's probably a really great place to start. But I'll give you some ideas on how to get organized. We're going to look at successful study strategies. We're going to look at how to answer a multiple choice question. And then we're going to look at the application process. So again, this is sort of a, an overview of the process. Again, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, and we are on Mountain Time, and our offices are open between 8 and 4. What is certification? We all passed our RN boards, which gave us a license as a generalist. All of you on this call tonight have specialized in perioperative nursing. So CNOR certification is a specialty certification that validates your expertise in this specialty. I have been an OR nurse for a long time. In the last two years, I have seen more changes in just healthcare in general than I ever have before. So if nothing else, certification gives you the confidence to be able to navigate through some pretty uncertain times where understanding what the ideal is and what's the reality and closing that gap as much as possible is I think our responsibility as, as competent practitioners. Here are our eligibility criteria. You need to be licensed as an RN, either in the state or the country in which you practice. CNOR is an international credential, so we have CNORs all over the world. You need to have completed a minimum of two years and 2,400 hours of perioperative nursing practice, and we look at four major roles. We look at who's eligible. Direct patient care, clinical practitioner, administration, teaching, or research. Understanding that the test is based on what a person with two years of experience should be able to know and do to practice safely. And most of people with two years of experience are still working in a general staff capacity. So if I've got managers or administrators or people in SPD, people who have moved away from that, that clinical nursing as their career advances, 
please understand that there will be a, a large proportion of the, the exam based on intraoperative care. At least 50% or 1,200 hours must be in the intraoperative setting. This has special significance for those people who have moved away from direct patient care. Let's, let's look at a couple of examples of that. Let's look at our um, OR manager who no longer provides direct patient care. Might go into a room and, and help open up a case, but really is, is not part of that patient's experience. However, they do hire people who then take care of patients. So that's an example of how our OR managers are eligible for the CNOR. Let's look at our um, informatics people who design our electronic health records that our perioperative nurses use for their, their patient charting. Even though they're, they're not personally in the OR, they are providing a service that impacts that patient during their interoperative experience. So again, they would also be eligible to sit for the CNOR. If you have any questions at all about eligibility, please call our credentialing specialist, and if they can't answer your question, they'll transfer you to me, and I'll be able to, to work with you, because I appreciate that not all of us have roles that fit neatly into one of those buckets. You also have to be currently employed in a perioperative setting. It can be full-time, it can be part-time, and we do not define what part-time looks like. So if you take call once a month, if you go in and give lunch reliefs, Whatever that may be, as long as if we validated your employment, they would be able to say, yes, this person works in our perioperative department. Okay, let's look at the exam. 200 multiple choice questions. It is time. You are given three hours and 45 minutes to complete the test. I've got some, some practice questions that we're going to um, go through and I will time you at least for the first one for a minute. So you have a sense for how long that is. And for most people and most questions, a minute is plenty of time. The test is updated annually to reflect um, any changes to our current perioperative guidelines. As you know, ARN guidelines, they come out with a new book every year. So we go through all of our test item bank make sure that our questions are still reflected accurately in the guidelines. AORN updates their guidelines, about 25% of those guidelines are updated every year. So we make sure that our, our exams are still accurate based on that. Barry and Combs came out with a brand new book last fall. Again, another one of our major references that is used to write our, our items for our tests. We went through updated um, all the questions that had Barry and Cohen's as a reference. So this is um, at least an annual, um, there are changes annually based on the references that, that come out that are new. Okay, so let's look at those resources. First of all, here's what's on the exam. This is the um, outline for the subject areas that are on the exam. CCI does not design this. We have groups of subject matter experts, perioperative nurses who hold the CNOR, who decide what our current clinical practice looks like. And they, we used to have nine subject areas. They rearranged things, combined some things, renamed some things, and now we have seven. If you look at this list, it pretty much follows what you would do in a day of taking care of a patient. The percentage of questions on, in the right-hand column indicates how many questions on the exam are from each of these subject areas. Here are our books that we use mostly when we are writing items for the exam. And again, CCI does not write the questions for the exam. These are, again are written by volunteers, CNORs, who um, are committed to maintaining a high level of integrity, 
in our exam item bank. And these are the references that they use. So it makes sense that these are the same references that you use to study from. First one is the current edition of AORN's guidelines for perioperative practice. Now, the, the new edition came out in January 2021. If you are using the 2020 edition, that's fine because we will not turn over our exam to reflect the 2021 guidelines until July 1st. So if you're using the 2020 version, that's fine. There's a couple of other reference books. Um, both Alexander's and Barry and Cohn's have been out for a long time, and you may have some pretty old versions in your, in your department. Please make sure that you're using the most current copies. Um, and then Jan Odom Foran has a really nice perianesthesia book that does, I think, a better job of um, describing the pre- and post-operative experience of the perioperative patient and also does a really nice job with emergencies, especially cardiac and respiratory. So check with your PACU and see if they have drains, perianesthesia, nursing. Now I'm going to try to hopefully save you a little bit of money if I can, because I know that taking this exam is expensive in both time and money. Check with your educator and your manager first to see if they don't have these books in your department. Sometimes they get squirreled away into somebody's office and you don't even know these things are available. These actually should be out where everybody can access them. So check with those folks first. If you have a library in your facility, check to see if these um, books aren't in your library. Check to see if somebody else has recently studied for the exam and will lend you their study materials. If you've exhausted all these possibilities and you decide I'm gonna to have to buy some books, um, the guidelines is only available through the AORN website. However, the other three books are available on Amazon. You can purchase them outright you can rent them for three months, or you can buy them and then sell them back. And you get about 30% back of what you paid for them. But those are all ways to um, try to save you a little bit of money when you're purchasing these, these reference books. You also, if there's a couple of you who are, um, are studying at the same time, you know, you could, you could pool your resources, everybody, you know, pitch in however much uh, money, and um, then you have those resources to share. You may also want to check with your with your manager. Um, some places will not reimburse you for your exam. See if they won't at least purchase the test prep materials. And again, these are resources that are useful for everyone, not only for people who are studying for the CNOR exam. Here are some additional references. Um, most of our patients are coming in to correct something that may have a, a medical cause behind it. So a good pathophysiology book um, gives you an extra insight into how a disease process may be affecting a person physiologically, as well as give you some clues on how they're going to react to the surgical experience itself. Tabers is the gold standard for a medical dictionary. Um, check with, again, check with your department. If you're in a hospital, check with your med surge units. Sometimes they have, unfortunately, a better um, medical library than the OR. Um, your lab should have a, a diagnostic lab manual. You may have a hospital formulary on your intranet, or you may have a PDR in your department. I use this Hippocrates. Um, resource a lot. It's free. You download the app to your phone and you can look up virtually any uh, drug that is in use in the United States right now. And it's updated all the time. So I like to use that because I know that I'm getting the most current information. If you are a member of AORN, you know that you get a journal every month. This is an excellent resource. I've had people tell me, this is why I passed the test, because I read my journal every month. I looked at those clinical articles talking about patients who I will never have the chance to care for. I 
you know, practice my test taking skills with those little quizzes at the end of the of some of those articles. It gave me um, that little summary of the updated guidelines. So this is really a great resource. If you are a member, think about sharing your journals with other people in your department who are sitting for the exam. The AMI standards, your SPD department should have these, and especially ST79 is, a, is the best resource. This is actually where AORN gets the information for their chapters on cleaning, disinfection, um, sterilization, packaging, all those kinds of things actually come from that resource. And then you can get a lot of information on websites. Um, Joint Commission has some information certainly about um, wrong site, wrong patient, wrong procedure, surgery, timeouts, thing, um, the national patient safety goals, things like that. CDC and World Health Organization both have really good information on just general health, you know, things like hand washing, transmissible infections, surgical site infections, things like that. Anything with .gov behind it is open access. Anybody can get to that information. And I think those are underutilized um, resources. So as you're um, getting ready for your exam, this is giving you permission to look beyond your normal day and um, expand your knowledge base. We have some free resources, um, our, and all these are on our website. Um, the candidate handbook has um, the that breakdown of the subject areas and then it has a further um, more complete outline if you look at appendix b in the handbook it'll actually tell you instead of just you know interoperative activities it'll have you know specimens and positioning and and really helps you to um, delineate more what is on the exam between the task and knowledge statements and the study plan, you should be able to organize a pretty sound plan for you. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. But the study plan takes those four major books that we just got you talking about, the AORN guidelines, Barry and Cones, Alexander's, and Drain's Perianesthesia Nursing. I've taken the key words from each of those seven subject areas and cross-reference them, sometimes down to the page, um, where the, that information is found in those references. So you don't have to you know, wade through a bunch of stuff that you already know, or you've only got 15 minutes, so you only wanna be looking at a, you know, a couple things. Um, it really helps you focus, um, hopefully save you some time as you're, as you're studying. We do have a few sample CNOR exam questions on our website. Please be aware that any questions that we share with you in terms of practice questions in the study guide, the online practice exam, the questions that we have tonight, none of those are going to be found on the test. Our CCI staff, we talked about our credentialing specialists are a great resource. There are three nurses on staff. Dawn and I will be the ones who will be working with you most closely in terms of questions that you may have about the exam that our credentialing specialists can't answer. And then we have webinars. I do this webinar um, almost every month. It's recorded. So if you need to come back and view it again, or if you have friends who weren't able to attend tonight, just know this is available. Um, it's on YouTube and also on our website. And we have webinars actually for all of our different credentials. So again, a, a great resource. Here are the materials that we sell. We have an exam prep book that we came out, ooh, I think in September of last year. So it's, it's very current. We added, I think an extra 100 practice questions to this book. Um, we have an on-demand prep course that, that mimics probably as close as it can get to the actual exam experience and gives you a breakdown of how well you performed on each area. Um, and I'm sorry, that was our online practice exam. Our on-demand prep course, we have um, a, a course that you can access and leave and come back as often as you'd like. Um, we are also starting to do synchronous prep for cert classes. So you have a couple of different options for prep for cert courses.
Let me see if we've got any questions before. get started. No, nope, don't see anything yet. Okay. Test taking strategies. Okay, everybody's busy and I get it. You you got um, a job, you've got a family, your kids are being homeschooled right now, you might be taking care of an elderly parent. Um, they've shuffled your work assignment around because you're not doing elective cases right now. I get that this is a really um, uncertain time. You need to set aside time for you to prepare for this exam. Look at what you already do well. Look at the types of cases that you do with the understanding that the exam is going to cover every specialty, every age group. So look at what you already do well and then start from there. Use the subject areas to organize your study plan. You can either look at the ones that have the greatest percentage of questions or the ones that you are least familiar with. But that's a way to start getting organized. I always say that studying for the CNR exam is like setting up for a big case. And you're not gonna go in for an anterior posterior spinal fusion at 725 and think that you can get everything ready for a 730 case. And this is no different. You have to, to get ready. And that tends to take a lot of the anxiety out of this is to prepare and have a plan in place. Nobody likes uncertainty and nobody likes the unknown. So take a couple, take a, some time to look at your own practice where your, where your strengths are, where are some opportunities for additional study. We recommend that you study for three months. Now this is highly variable. Some people take longer, some people take much less. The point is that you have a goal in mind with a specific date, because if you're like me, you put it off and you put it off um, and then you're rushing. So let's just look at your life for the next year and what does it look like? Is somebody getting married? Is somebody having major surgery? Um, whatever it, those life events are, take that into consideration as you're planning your study and your testing date. We all like to think that we can do multiple things at one time, but we can't do anything as well as if we did it one at a time. So be honest with yourself, Put this phone in a different room, turn off the TV. This is really your time for you. And trying to study for eight hours on Saturday is not going to, is it truly is not going to work. Um, nobody can study for that long. Um, usually it's about 15 or 20 minutes and your attention starts wandering, which means I've already started to lose some of you. Um, but recognize that. Study for 20 minutes, put it down, get up, do something else for five minutes, reflect on what you just read. Oh, what did they say about, you know, that pressure injury, that, that nerve that's involved in lobotomy position, I can't remember. Go back and review. Um, very few of us can successfully do something after the first time we see it. So, it's really better to review multiple times than to try to get through everything once. Look at the broad concepts instead of just that one question on the flashcard that talks about potassium. The question on the exam may be calcium or magnesium or sodium. So rather than just learning about potassium, do an overview of all the electrolytes. Instead of just the question about lithotomy position, all of the pressure points for all the different positions. So really have a, a good broad base. Um, and then a lot of people like to um, practice by taking multiple choice exams and, and that's fine. There are a lot of other companies besides us that provide exams. Some of them do a good job, some of them don't. Before you purchase anything, look at the references. If they're using Alexander's from 1999, that is, information that's way too old to be used on the exam. If they don't have references, if they um, 
if they if the references aren't including those four books that we just got to talking about, again, that information may not be useful for you as you prepare for the exam. Okay, let's look at multiple choice questions. The stem of the question is going to contain all the information that you need to answer the question. So if you don't need to know how much the patient weighs or what their sex is or how old they are, it's not gonna be in the STEM. And please don't add it. Um, everything you need to know is in the STEM. So the, the goal is to answer the question as it is written. There are four options, A, B, C, D, with only one correct answer. Now I hear not infrequently, well, I wouldn't do all of those things or none of them were correct. One of those is the best option based on our current literature. So that's that's our, our mission is to pick out which, that, which of those is the correct answer. The other three options are called distractors and that's their job is to make sure that you are able to pick the correct answer from those four options. There are no true faults, no multiple multiple choice. Um, I know that the ARN journal, their um, little quizzes have you know all of the above, none of the above. Those aren't on the CNOR exam. There are no calculations, there are no anatomical drawings, um, no pictures. Just it's just text, just words. If you are having difficulty understanding what the question asks of you. These questions are asking you to critically think. So frequently there is some kind of a word that homes in on what would you do first? What's the best approach? What's the most common complication? Those kinds of things. So make sure that you don't miss those, um, those words that will help you critically think as you analyze that question. Here are some common test taking errors and especially reading into the STEM or overthinking are, are more frequently done by my nurses with a lot of years of experience. So, so please don't, don't add things to the question, take it as, as written. Taking too much time to answer the question. Now we said this, this um, test is timed. You should be able to answer a question a minute. If you are able to do that, you will finish in time and be able to go back and check your answers as well. Please, please, please do not spend 20 minutes on one question. If anything that is left blank will be marked wrong. So make sure that you can get through the exam. Missing the, those words, best, first, most often, um, changing answers to multiple questions. I, I never say never change an answer because once in a while something will trigger and you'll think, oh man, you know what? I need to go back and, and change the answer to a, a question I just finished. But it's better not, if you're truly not sure, give it your best guess and move on. And again, you will never see the same questions on the exam as you see in any of our, our practice questions. Especially when we're not sure of the answer, we tend to revert back to our own clinical experience. And sometimes that experience can be quite a while ago. Um, when I first started in the OR, our patients were admitted the night before. We didn't have AM admin. They came in the night before, we did our pre-op teaching, they had their enemas and their, you know, got them all set, their lab work. Everything was ready for the next morning. We also shaved them the night before. Now, if I was looking at a question on the exam about skin preps, and I answered based on my experience, I would miss that question. So that's why it's so important. Yes, our experience is, in, is vital, but it needs to be meshed and married with what is considered current best practices right now. And that's why we recommend those references that we've talked about already. 
there are a multitude of reasons why a facility may not be able to practice a guideline to the letter. And especially right now, I know here in, in Denver, we're still you know, using a mask all day and reprocessing things that were supposed to be single use. Um, the, the exam is built on the ideal. So whatever your current practice is, if it's for whatever reason not able to follow the ideal, that doesn't absolve us from knowing what that ideal is. So please um, don't look at your own personal setting um, when you're answering these questions, especially if um, there's a, a, a gap between the ideal and reality. This is my favorite one, and I still hear this periodically. I'll ask people, well, why did you pick the, the, the answer that you did? And they'll say, well, you know what? I'm not sure. I just pick option B. The only way that could work is if every answer was option B, because everybody gets stuck on different questions. So please don't, don't use that strategy. Um, our, our folks who write our, our questions, the options are the same length, number of words, usually to within one or two words. So there is no longer option or shorter option. And they're screened carefully to make sure that a word in the stem is not repeated in an option. Now, some practice uh, exams or flashcards may not have that same rigor. But please don't look at the CNR exam as some kind of a game or a trick that you can figure out a way to get to an answer without knowing it. You are holding people's lives in your hands. This is a high stake exam. And we take it very seriously and make sure that the questions and the answers are reflecting what is considered ideal practice. Okay, this is something that you can kind of run through if you are not sure of an answer. And especially if you're just starting to study and you got your flashcards and your practice questions and you read the first question, you go, I don't even know. It's like this question dropped down from Mars. I have no idea. So let's, you know, it's I know it causes anxiety when you don't know something. So let's have a plan in place. What do I need to know to answer this question? What is it asking me? Is it asking me part of the nursing process? Is it asking me about a drug? Is it asking me to identify an emergency situation? What is it asking me? And if I don't know about malignant hyperthermia, where could I go to get more information? And you will use that skill for the rest of your professional life. Because guess what? We can't know everything all the time, but knowing we should be able to know where to get that answer. And this is probably one of my favorite tips that I tell people is there's four options. If you, even if you're not sure of the answer, if you can get rid of three of those options, there's, you know, last man standing, it's gotta be that one. Even if you may not agree with it, um, that's the one that's left. So those are um, some um, tips for breaking down a question. So we've got some sample questions. Um, and I've got this, let me pull up the poll because that slide My B and C's got mixed up. So I'm going to launch a, a poll. You're actually going to vote. And just click on the, um, the age specific group that is most commonly associated with eye muscle procedures. And I'm going to give you a minute.
Okay, we've got about five seconds left. Okay, there we go. Let's see how we did here. Okay, we were split 60-40 between pediatrics and geriatrics. Having a little bit of, here we go. So this was a, a question about eyes. And if you don't do eyes, this would be an area where you go, you know what, I need to get more information about this. I either start, you need to do a couple of eye cases at work. That's not possible. I need to either look at varying cones or Alexander's that have both have an entire chapter on eye surgery. Okay, the correct answer is pediatric. Now for the people who chose geriatric, what you did was you looked at eye, you looked at age specific, you thought cataract and you marked geriatric. This is an example of our brain moving faster than, um, than it should. So we're looking at eye muscle procedures. Um, we try to do these early in a in a little munchkin's life so they don't get used to looking at the world that way i mean there's our reference we always for all of our practice questions and i can't speak for other companies but we always provide the rationale and the reference so you could look this up um, if you had questions or want to learn more about eyes okay Next question, let me go in, launch our next poll, and thanks for voting, guys. Here we go. Most effective way to evaluate a patient's comprehension of her upcoming surgery is to, and you have four options. Fifteen seconds left. Okay. And I'm not quite sure why it's doing this. Okay. Everybody got this question right. You are absolutely right. The best way to know how well somebody understands anything is to have them basically talk it back to you. So nicely done. Okay. Last question. Okay, this question concerns an incorrect count. And what would be the first thing the perioperative nurse should do when she discovers an incorrect count?
We've got about 10 seconds left. Okay, time's up. This is very typical of this question. It's usually sometimes as much as 50-50 um, between options A and B. So let's, let's look at this one a little bit. Um, what we want to do when we are answering questions on the exam is we want to pick the option that's going to help resolve the issue. So we've got an incorrect count. And I think that this option with repeating the count is a, a logical first response. Myself as the circulator, I missed something. I, you know, there were maybe there was two ray tech that are stuck together in the kick bucket, or something got kicked under the bed, or whatever it was. It must have been something that I missed. So I will start repeating the count. What happens while I am repeating the count? The surgeon is continuing to close. He or she has no idea that the count is incorrect. So to get them to stop closing, to avoid a sentinel event and harm to our patient, we got to tell them, there's an incorrect, we're missing a lap sponge. Please re-explore the wound. I'm going to start looking everywhere else. So that's the way you can kind of walk through. Um, I mean, eventually all of these options may be correct, but the first thing we have to do is tell the surgeon. Okay, so let's stop that. Okay, so we've done a little analysis. Notify the surgeon. For those of you who are going to repeat the count, here is the reference, and AORN has an entire chapter on prevention of retained um, surgical items. So that's a, that's a good refresher for all of us. Okay, good job. And if you had, I don't know that anybody had any trouble managing the voting part of this. It's, this is pretty much how it's gonna be when you take the actual exam in terms of your um, computer expertise. It's it's pretty straightforward. Okay, um, I'm going to pause for questions. If anybody has any right now before we finish up this last this last section. Okay, so far so good. Let's look at how to apply. Okay, you need to have a CCI account and it doesn't cost you anything to set this up, but this is how we communicate with you. This is how you get your applications through. So this is, this is an important thing. Um, there's some information that we ask you to provide that you may not just know off the top of your head, like your supervisor's phone number or your license number for your RN license. So if you have all this information available when you start filling out your, um, your account, it goes really quick. So here is when you say start my application, you're going to see some prompts where you can go in and get more information. And a lot of this is what we've already covered. We talked about eligibility, talked about when's a good time for you to take this test. Um, talk, we just talked about creating a CCI account or logging into your existing account. Please understand if you already have an account and you're having trouble getting in, you forgot your password or whatever, you think, well, shoot, I'm just gonna 
make up another account, please, please, please don't do that. If you're having trouble getting into your account, call our credentialing specialist and they'll help you reset your password. But two accounts is a recipe for disaster. Um, everything from your previous account doesn't get automatically rolled over into your new account. So now you've got this parallel tracks. So please don't have more than one account. Um, you're gonna schedule your exam by click, clicking on the PSI exam scheduling button in your CCI account. Um, and that's after you've submitted your application. What you do is you're gonna apply. So let's say you're gonna apply in April. You are ready. Your testing window is the next three months. So that would be May, June, and July. And you will pick a date and a time at a testing center that's convenient for you to schedule your exam. We audit a certain percentage of all of our applications. This is no different from Joint Commission coming in and doing a survey in your department. What they're doing is making sure that you are providing care at a certain level. Our accrediting body, just like Joint Commission, wants to make sure that we're following the rules and we're doing things like letting only people who are eligible test and that we have guidelines in place and policies and all those kinds of things. So if you are audited, it doesn't mean necessarily that you've done anything wrong. It means that you are helping us to maintain the integrity of our processes so that um, we can be assured the people who are sitting for the exam truly are eligible. Here's our fee, um, $395. Please understand that this price can change. I don't have any information that this is going to go up anytime soon, but if you're not gonna test until way later in the year, please check again just before you apply to make sure that, that price is still the same. We talked about applying and paying one month and your three month testing window. So we covered that. We have a, a new testing partner, which really doesn't mean anything for you. It's the same exam. Um, our new testing partner, the good thing about them is they have more testing sites that are available. The other good thing is that we have what's called remote proctoring where you can take the exam from home if you would prefer. Now, for some of you, if you're in the military or in a really you know, rural place, hundreds of miles from a testing center, this may be a really nice option. But I ask you to make sure that you are able to replicate the testing center in your home because that is what you will be asked to do. You will have someone watching you the entire time that you test. You will need to make sure that your, um, that your computer and your internet, your internet are able to, to support the exam. I took a certification exam in December of last year and I thought, oh, you know, December, Colorado, the weather can be bad, the roads can be bad. Our testing site is clear across town. I thought, oh, would be so great. I'll do this remote proctoring. So I went in and I looked up all the things that I had to do. And one of the things I had to do was you can't have any, you will be asked to basically film your entire room where you're going to be taking your test. And there can't be any books or you know, nothing on the walls, nothing that can make it look like you've got an unfair advantage. And my little room is full of books. I would have had to have moved three bookcases out. So right then I started going, you know, this is just really not for me. And then I looked at, will my internet support this test? And if the wind blows really hard, I lose on my internet. I thought, I don't want to have to mess with worrying about this. I'll just drive across town and take it in the testing center. It's up to you. Everybody's different and everybody has different circumstances. But please understand that there are responsibilities associated with taking the test no matter where you decide to finally take it. When you schedule a remote proctored exam, you'll again 
the looking at meeting, making sure you meet your CNOR eligibility, you'll have your account set up. You're going to be asked to check your computer compatibility and download the software that's going to support this exam. When you schedule your exam, it's going to run a systems check to make sure. So for whatever reason, your computer isn't going to be able to handle this technology, you'll know and you'll be asked to, um, you know, to pick a testing site and, and go test in person. We have a program called Take Two, which allows two testing um, attempts for one price. Check with your facility because your facility may already have a Take Two program. But what happens is there's one fee that's paid. If you pass the first time, unfortunately, you don't get any money back. But if you aren't successful, you are able to test again at no cost. So that's just um, a, a program that we that we um, have available for people if they should choose um, to, to go that way. It can either be an individual or a facility. Okay, recertification. I know that you are focused on this exam and that's where you should be, but please understand that in five years, you need to have a plan in place to recertify. You probably have people in your facility who've been CNORs for a long time. They say, oh, just do your contact hours, you'll be fine. Well, starting January 1st of this year, your only option to recertify is our points method. Okay, you can't take the exam, you can't uh, recertify using only contact hours. Our points method is actually a better method for demonstrating continued competence because it's you're able to showcase things that you do every day. Unless you work for Fiedler, nobody's doing contact hours for a living. And there's no correlation between contact hours and a change or improvement in practice. So what we've done is look seriously at our recertification method, look at the trends, look at the industry, look at what our accreditation organizations are recommending and made this change several years ago. It's been, I think, at least three years ago, we started having the points option available. All kinds, there's probably 30 different activities you can choose from. One of them is contact hours. You need to have 300 points. Of those 300 points, 100 points can be contact hours. And then you would choose from precepting, um, publishing, sitting on a committee, um, there's case studies, going back to school, holding other certifications. There's just, please take some time, look at all of those different options. They're all capped or limited with the exception of academic studies. So if you're in school right now and you're taking, and you take six or seven classes in this five year accrual window, you're set. You don't have to do anything else. Please, 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 though, save the evidence. Look at our handbook, look in the back, look to see what you would have to provide if you are audited. Because if you are audited, you'll be asked to provide those contact hour certificates. You'll be asked to provide those minutes from those meetings. You'll be asked to provide information about the people that you presented. So please, please, please keep track of this stuff now. The other thing is that your accrual window for your recertification starts in 2021. So you can actually be looking at some of these things now as you're preparing for the exam. Here's our accrual period for points. 2021, you test, you pass. Your credential is valid until December 31st of 2026. Your accrual window begins January 1st of this year and ends December 31st of 2025. Okay, I, every, every year people get surprised by this. So please, you've got five years from January 1st of 2021 until December 31st of 2025. In 2026, you will need to recertify your credential if you want to keep it. If you recertify before, July 1st, you'll get 50 bucks off your um, recertification fee. 
again, we are recording this. Um, this webinar it will be on YouTube. Give give Taylor a couple days once I send her the, the link to get this up and running. And it should also be on our website as a resource for all of you. I am open to questions. So please go ahead and um, either type in the chat box or I'll open up the, the question. I got some questions here in the question box. Okay, there was a question about um, facilities that have a perioperative RN fellowship. Um, and this person's from, from New York. I do not personally know of any. Um, depending on the area that you're in, you might want to just check with some of the area hospitals to see what kind of, uh, and I'm assuming it's some kind of an uh, uh, RN residency um, program for, for new hires who don't have OR experience. But I would check with with the schools, or I'm sorry, the, the hospitals in your area. The other place you may check is with AORN, our specialty organization. They may have information on nurse residency programs. Good question. It looks like I've got somebody who's, who's early in their um, very happy career. Okay, here's a question. I'm a dialysis RN. My dream is to become an OR. RN. Yes. Um, sometimes you, it, it, it takes a little while to get your foot in the door. Don't give up. Don't give up. And sometimes you may start out in you know, admissions or PACU. Once you're in a facility, it's easier to transfer to another department in that facility than to come in from the outside. But please, if this is a dream of yours, don't give up. Do the eligibility hours Okay, does the eligibility hours to apply for certification can be combined with two facilities? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, if you've looked in a couple places and need to use them to get your combined um, two years, 24 hours, yes, it doesn't have to be all in one facility. Good question. Okay, there's um, a, a person here is from Saudi Arabia. I hate to think what time it is. I hope I'm not keeping you up at midnight for this webinar. Um, yes, yes, you can apply for the CNOR. It is no different for you in Saudi Arabia. Um, you may, your, your testing options may be a little bit more limited, but yes, we, if our military folks take this test all over the world. So it would be no different for you. You may want to check with one of our credentialing specialists um, about um, your testing options and remote proctoring may be the best way for you to go. It just kind of depends. But yes, you may take this, this um, test. You don't have to be in the US to take this test. Does AORN Congress or OR manager attendance count towards points? What you would do is the education that you receive at these conferences would count towards your contact hours. Yes, and again, they are capped, but we take uh, with AORN, with any contact hours that you get from AORN, if you put them into your log and then there's a, I'm sorry, anything that you take from AORN, there's a button on your, in your account that just says something about AORN contact hours, just push that button and it brings them over 
so you don't have to retype them in. So check that. Um, but again, there's a cap, so the number of contact hours that can be approved. But yes, we will accept continuing education from either one of those. Okay. Looks like. And even more. Questions yet. The whole, I don't even know what time it is. Six o'clock. I appreciate if people need to go feed a pet or a spouse or children and need to sign off, that's fine. Um, again, I'll stay until the questions are answered and we are recording so you can come back in and, and listen to this last part if you need to. I'm not seeing any more questions. It has been my pleasure to be with you tonight. Best of luck for this next stage of your professional journey. One of the best things you can do for yourself is to become certified. So again, questions, call our, our folks. I think I've got, yeah, there's our, our phone numbers. So don't hesitate to contact us with questions. Everybody have a good rest of your evening. Stay safe, be well, and let us know if you have questions. Take good care and bye.